serendipity and an honor to stand in this sacred desk where 132 years ago, uh, my own pastoral predecessor at Dallas, Dr. George W. Truett, preached his first formal sermon. He had, he had preached a couple of times at White Wright, his home church, although he refused to ever stand behind the pulpit. He would always go down at the front because he said he was not called to be a preacher. But after God called him to preach, he received an invitation from Sherman, Texas, to preach in the First Baptist Church. And so by horse and buggy, he journeyed that 19 miles from White Rock, uh, White Wright to Sherman and stood in this same pulpit and preached his first sermon, as Dr. Greenway said, uh, entitled, Let There Be Light. Years later, recounting that experience with a twinkle in his eye, he said, and my own light burned out in 10 minutes. <laughs> and all of us who preached the first sermon can certainly identify with that. So thank you, Dr. Greenway, for the honor of standing here today the privilege of delivering this Founders Day Address. This is a significant season in higher theological education, and it has never been more important to understand our Founders' vision. Not only that, but to continue to respect and implement it in preparing a, these new generations for gospel ministry. You know, the president of an institution like Southwestern is a sacred stewardship. We're simply stewards. We don't have a ministry. We have received a ministry from God, and it is a sacred stewardship. Across the decades, this stewardship has been held by nine men, the majority of whom, five of whom, I've been privileged to know personally. This stewardship entails the constant attention to being faithful, and true to the vision set out by our founder, Benaja Harvey Carroll. You know, it's almost impossible to describe the influence that Dr. Carroll had on evangelicalism in his day. The word influence comes from two words in Latin, in and flow, and the word pictures of a mighty river flowing vibrant and crystal clear with a strong current, and into that river, uh, come these little tributaries and creeks and streams that are poured into that river and are caught up in its flow. We're here today because of the legendary life of B.H. Carroll and the fact that we, like thousands who've come before us, have been caught up in his flow, in our love, and in our support for our alma mater, Southwestern Seminary. In preparation for this address, I read the charters of a lot of former schools, or present schools, particularly those older ones. And time doesn't permit me to share with you all that I learned about them, but just simply to use one as an example of many others, Harvard. Uh, some of those others, Yale, founded by Congregationalists, Columbia, founded by Episcopalians, Brown, founded by some of our Baptist forefathers. Harvard was founded in 1643 and was incorporated in 1650 with this founding motto, for the glory of Christ. In its document of incorporation, it states as its primary goal, it says, and then quotes from John chapter 17, verse 3. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. This founder's vision, their founder's vision, was long lost in pursuits of other secular endeavors. And I really doubt that anybody on that Cambridge campus today would say that the primary goal of that institution is that they might know thee and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. We assemble here today on this Founders Day to be reminded that we are stewards 
who have remained faithful to our Founders' vision. We hold a rich heritage here. Heritage is a wonderful possession. I'll never forget the first day I ever came into this room for chapel. 52 years ago. On a, I'm old. <laughs> on a cold January morning, freshly graduated from the business school at Texas Christian University, sat on the fourth or fifth row over here on that aisle, and heard Dr. Robert Naylor declare that I was now an official Southwesterner. Here on this hill, I was nurtured in the faith, encouraged by so many good and godly professors who marked my life. As Southwesterners, we have a rich heritage, but to find the strength of this institution, we must journey back to the roots, back to the life and the legacy of our founder on this Founders Day, B.H. Carroll. Carroll was hands down the most influential Southern Baptist leader of his day and time. He was a giant, not just in physical stature, but in influence, and his presence was often intimidating, and his passion was always courageous and contagious. Like all our presidents who come after him, he had a pastor's heart. For 28 years, he served as pastor of the First Baptist Church in Waco, Texas, while at the same time developing his intensive course on the English Bible at Baylor. While serving as a trustee of Southern Seminary in Louisville, he became increasingly burdened by the fact that the great and growing Southwest needed their own seminary, which would stand as a bulwark against error. While being committed to theological orthodoxy, developing the highest standards and research and scholarship, while at the same time inspiring students to be actively engaged in evangelism and missions centered in and through the local church. This has been one of the distinguishing characteristics of Southwestern. In preparation for this morning's assignment, I've also read many of the previous addresses that have been delivered on Founders Day, each of them filled with important information, dates, and facts that constitute our beginnings. Dates like 1905, when out of Carroll's heart was launched that Baylor Theological Seminary, growing out of its Bible department, where he had taught. 1908, when seeing the need for a separation from, the, from Baylor, Carroll founded Southwestern Baptist Theological Institute, uh, Seminary. 1909, when the Baptist General Convention of Texas, meeting in Dallas, formally voted to support the pledging enterprise. And of course, 1910, when Southwestern moved to this hill here in South Fort Worth. But what about what was going on behind the scenes, back of those dates, as the birth of our seminary was taking place? B.H. Carroll didn't simply announced that he was going to start a new seminary and move it to Fort Worth. In fact, he met tremendous opposition, and not from his foes, but from some of his best friends. Had it not been for his personal tenacity and his focused faithfulness to the vision he was convinced he had received from God, we would not be seated here today over a hundred years later on this holy hill. This Founders Day address now is going to just have two parts to it. First, how the seminary came about. That is, behind the birth of his vision. And secondly, how the vision grew. The practical substance and application of B.H. Carroll's vision, particularly as it relates to our seminary and the Southern Baptist Convention today. So first, how the Southwestern Seminary came about that is, behind the, ver the birth of this vision. The vision of Southwestern Seminary was conceived in the mind and gestated in the heart of B.H. Carroll. However, like the birth of a baby, it actually experienced its birth pangs out of an internal conflict of two of his favorite and most prized students at Baylor, George W. Truett, 
and J. Frank Norris. Truett, uh, in, 80, in 1897, Baylor graduate, had played a major role in saving the university from financial ruin, and uh, then became a student, graduated. Shortly after his graduation, he was called to be pastor of the First Baptist Church in Dallas, where he rose to national world, really, recognition during the next almost half of a century. And for 30 years, he served as a prominent and positive trustee of Southwestern Seminary. Norris graduated from Baylor a few years later in 1903. He was a brilliant student, graduating second in his class to J.M. Dawson, his college roommate who later became pastor of the First Baptist Church in Waco after Carroll. Norris went on to Southern Seminary where he was honored in delivering the valedictory address in 1905, recommended by Carroll to the pastor of the First Baptist Church in 1909. He grew that church to be recognized as the largest in the world for an extended period of time. Ironically, the first commencement here on this hill in 1910 had two speakers, Truett and Norris, both spoke at that commencement. Carroll's passion and his insistence in separating the seminary from Baylor led to a somewhat strained relationship with Palmer Brooks, who was then president of the university. But the decision to move the seminary to the fast-growing Dallas-Fort Worth area resonated in the heart of the new pastor at First Baptist Church in Fort Worth. Historians have, by and large, failed to credit Norris's primary and pivotal role not simply in the birth of Southwestern, but in its, in its establishment and its eventual home on this hill where we sit today. Although George W. Truett later served as a Southwestern trustee and longtime chairman of the board, as well as being memorialized by this auditorium in which we're seated, seated today, Truett Auditorium, in his honor, he originally sought to form a coalition of A.J. Barton, J.B. Gambrell, Samuel Palmer Brooks, and others to oppose and prevent Carroll's dream of moving the seminary to come to fruition, according to Southwestern's late historian, Leon Macbeth. Carroll encountered, quote, enormous, massive opposition from this coalition of Baptist respected leaders. According to Macbeth, Truett preferred that the seminary remain down there at his beloved Baylor, perhaps fearing it would interfere, interfere with his efforts to raise money for the sanatorium, Baylor Hospital, and Buckner's Orphan's Home in Dallas. Even though Truett strongly opposed the move by the sheer power of his personality, he was appointed chairman of the committee that was to find a place for the seminary here in the Metroplex. Uh, in hopes of, maybe in hopes of dampening the spirit of the move from Baylor to Waco, Truett recommended to the seminary that it be established on two small zero-line lots in the Oak Cliff section of Dow. Not two blocks, not two acres, two small lots in the city of Dallas in the Oak Cliff section. This infuriated our founder, B.H. Carroll. In a lengthy letter to Truett, like Truett has never received, I'm sure, a letter like this before, dated March 30th, 1909, and housed in our archives here, you can read it, Carroll let Truett know in no uncertain terms that he considered the recommendation of two small lots, not even a half of a city block, an insult beyond measure. He let him know that he did not intend the seminary to be what he then typed in all caps as though he were shouting. Some two by four, two bit seminary. <laughs> Norris seized the moment. At the time, he was editor and owner of the Baptist Standard. And uh, while on a brief visit to Dallas, Carol asked Norris to visit with him in his room at the old Oriental Hotel. Norris details that visit 
in one of his books. He said, I went into his room. What a giant figure he was, standing way above six feet, and with that long, venerable white beard, I thought I was standing in the presence of the prophet Samuel. He said, what do you think of a seminary here in the Southwest? You were my student for four years, and you took my English Bible course. I was for it, and I told him so, Norris said. He said, all I want is plenty of space in the Baptist standard. I told him you can have front page and you can have that space. And soon the articles and telegrams came from B.H. Carroll and they filled the pages of the standard. The Truett and Brooks-led opposition began to pour in arguments to the standard and counter articles to the standard. And Norris poured every one of them into the wastebasket. (laughs) Possessing the single tool that could reach all of Texas Baptists. Norris began using the front page of the Baptist Standard every week to promote the move of the seminary to Fort Worth. Agitated by what they considered to be a one-sided approach, Truett, who was a member of the board of, tri- uh, board of Directors of the Baptist Standard, called a secret meeting of the Board of Directors to fire Norris. Having heard of this, Norris being the majority stockholder and owner of the standard, called a meeting of the stockholders and preempted by firing all the board of directors. (laughs) You can't make this up. This is all behind the vision. And uh, there was a lot going on behind the scenes in the formative years. Norris's campaign for the seminary gained huge momentum won the hearts of Baptists all over Texas. Thus, in 1909, at the annual convention, the state convention meeting held in Truett's own First Baptist Church in Dallas, it was young Norris, not Truett, standing before that convention in the pulpit, making the appeal for the move of the seminary to Fort Worth. Southwestern's legendary historian, Robert Baker, my church history professor here, over 50 years ago. Reporting in his book, Tell the Generations Following, says that not since Peter preached at Pentecost and baptized thousands of uh, of converts has there been anything more glorious than the founding, endowing, locating of Southwestern Theological Seminary. He quotes Norris as speaking in unbroken eloquence saying that and addressing the crowd that day. Thus, Carroll's Seminary, referred to as the crown jewel of theological education, which later, under the presidency of Robert Naylor, became the largest in the world, found a new home here on Seminary Hill, in no small part because of the efforts and influence of young J. Frank Norris. Later in 1909, Norris, recommended by Carol himself, was called to be pastor of First Baptist Church in Fort Worth, one of the most powerful, wealthy, and prestigious pulpits of its day. And Norris immediately became instrumental in raising the first $100,000 to move the seminary to Fort Worth and led the First Baptist Church Fort Worth to pay half of that. He didn't stop there. He raised, helped raise the needed $200,000 for the construction of Fort Worth Hall, leading the congregation downtown here in Fort Worth to give half of that. Baylor and Texas Baptist historian Alan Lefevre, of whom I have a lot of respect, and even though he's sitting here today, I hate to admit that, Alan, but I do. In his own biography of B.H. Carroll entitled Fighting the Good Fight, states of Norris, when the doors to the new school opened, no stronger supporter existed outside Carroll himself than J. Frank Norris. After the death of Carroll in 1914, for a number of reasons detailed in my book, which the president mentioned in the name of God, Norris broke from the seminary and in the ensuing years and decades became our most fierce adversary. Most likely two issues were in his mind. One, many believed he saw himself as the true recipient of Carroll's charge to Scarborough and that he should have been president of the seminary. Secondly, he deeply resented the fact that Scarborough, immediately after Carroll's death, did away with the seminary founder's English Bible course that was so close to Carroll's heart and with which Norris himself had been trained at Baylor. After Carroll's death, it was Truett 
who became the positive influence and supporter of the second president, L.R. Scarborough, and who faithfully served and supported the seminary until his own death 30 years later, his positive presence, his influential integrity will always loom high and heavy over these hallowed halls, but it should be noted and remembered, as Lefevre admits, concerning the founding of the seminary, Carroll had no better or more committed proponent and partner in ministry than J. Frank Norris. None. Behind the conception and gestation of Carroll's vision, it was Norris, not Truett, who was lending a hand and assisting Dr. Carroll in the delivery room when the seminary was actually born. But sadly, Norris abandoned the school. In its early growth days, it was Truett who took the young school by the hand and led it to maturity. And secondly, and finally, how the vision grew, the practical substance of B.H. Carroll's vision, particularly as it relates to us in Southern Baptist life today. Immediately after the birth of the seminary, of course, it began to grow. And like a child that has been conceived and gestated and birthed, growth costs, it costs time and it costs energy and it costs money when a child or a seminary is having growth spurts. Southwestern's growth across these many decades can be reflected in its unique ability to stay faithful, unlike a lot of schools, to its founder's vision. We, have, we serve a, a complicated and complex Southern Baptist Convention today. In many ways, it is fragmenting before our eyes, currently caught in the conflict of several significant issues of which we don't have time to deal with each of them today, but I want to touch briefly on four. First, for Southern Baptist, biblical fidelity and trustworthiness will always be the, force, uh, the foremost issue because it goes straight to the heart of evangelism and missions, the two hallmarks upon which this institution stands. Additionally, we have increasingly different opinions as it relates to confessional statements. Most Southern Baptists and all her national entities hold and adhere to the Baptist Faith and Message 2000 some rejecting it for the Baptist faith in message 60, uh, 1963 and, and their interpretation of such, and still others reject both of them in favor of formulating their own confessions or often reflecting new cultural nuances. Third, there's a growing debate about the place of women in the pulpit, particularly as it relates to women as pastors of local churches. Finally, the issue of cooperative giving, the cooperative program, cooperation in Southern Baptist life is a major issue today. So on a day when we celebrate our founder, B.H. Carroll, many wonder what he would say or how he would address these particular four heightened markers of concern and debate in SBC life today. And fortunately, we do not have to remain wondering, debating, in suspense about what his convictions would be he left us hundreds of pages of commentary and writings which speak specifically to these matters. Carroll was a man of courage. He was a man of conviction. He was a man of consistency. And he was a man of cooperation. And today we see the practical substance of his vision in that, like righteous Abel, he being dead still speaks. So let's let our founder, as we close, address these four brief issues today in his own words. We celebrate today a founder whose name is synonymous with courage. As to the issue of the trustworthiness of the Bible, he leaves no doubt of his courageous and unwavering stance. Some in the wor our world today try to pit the words of Jesus against the words of Paul, for example. Uh, some elevate the words written in red as more authoritative than those written in black in our Bibles. Let's allow our founder to address this modern issue of the Bible today. Listen closely to his own words uh, recorded on numerous occasions stating his belief in what he called, quote, the verbal plenary inspiration of the Word of God. He believed that this seminary has been built upon the fact that every word is inspired by God, not simply dynamic and spread, not simply thoughts or ideas, but every word of every verse of every chapter of every book, verbal plenary inspiration. In his classic work, Inspiration of Scripture, Carroll framed it thus, one part, that is of the Bible, 
is no more inspired than any other part. It is perfectly foolish to talk about degrees of inspiration. What Jesus said in the flesh as we find it in the four Gospels is not more his word than what the inspired apostle or prophet has said. Carol knew we could not pit the words of Christ over the words of Paul as some seek to do today. He was a man of the Bible, a man of courage, and being dead still speaks. And throughout the decades, this has been the one single Southern Baptist seminary that with virtually every administration has insisted on the infallibility and the inerrancy of Scripture, in Carroll's words, the verbal plenary inspiration of Scripture. Carroll's not only a man of courage, he was a man of conviction. There's disagreement in SBC Live today concerning confessions and statements of faith. This is evidenced here in our own state of Texas where two State conventions don't agree on this. One has accepted the Baptist Faith and Message 2000. The other, the Baptist Faith and Message 1963. Others in our Baptist family adhere to neither of them in favor of adopting their own or simply resting on the old Baptist adage, no creed, no confession, but the Bible. And in so doing, some pervert actually... The doctrine of the priesthood of the believer to mean so someone can believe virtually anything they want to, the scripture to mean. Did Carroll believe in confessional statements? Listen to what he said. In his own words from the interpretation of the English Bible, volume 15, page 140, the modern cry, less creed and more liberty, is a degeneration from the vertebrate to the jellyfish. And it means less unity and less morality, and it means more heresy. It's a hurtful sin to magnify liberty at the expense of doctrine. Carroll was a prophet, not in his own mind like some today, but in, in his own time. How these words need to ring out today. These are the words of our founder. These are the principles upon which this seminary was established. Carroll regularly, unapologetically employed the New Hampshire Confession uh, which, as most of us know, formed the basis for the original Baptist faith and message statement. In his work, Baptist Church Policy, he stated that he encouraged the use of covenants and confessions for the sake of three things, identity, unity, and doctrinal strength. Uh, thank, I'm, I'm very thankful that seminary, our Seminary Hill Press has, has published B.H. Carroll Pulpit, 40 sermons, and in there there's a two-part sermon on confessions and and, 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 uh, and uh, con uh, confessions and creeds that you should read. B.H. Carroll was a man not only of consistency or, or care, of courage and conviction, but of consistency. He did not let, hear me, cultural nuances or political correctness to influence biblical interpretation and conviction. Carroll saw in his day a tendency on the part of some to view Scripture through the lens of culture. But he always insisted that the culture must be viewed through the lens of Scripture. For Carol, biblical truth did not mean one thing to one generation and another to the next and another to the next. He was a man of consistency. He had much to say regarding the modern cultural debate in SBC Life today about the place of women. In fact, you should know that few men in his day are ours had more respect for women in ministry than B.H. Carroll. Down in his church in First Baptist Waco, he, he had a group of ladies he referred to unapologetically as deaconesses. But when you read his writings and you read his interpretation of the English Bible, pastoral epistles where he deals with that, they were not in any way some ruling office of the church. They served other women in the church in matters he said were too delicate for men, like baptism and, and house visitation uh, in the administration of charity. And in fact, a careful reading of his volume on the pastoral epistles shows a consistency throughout of masculine pronouns each and every time he referred to the ministry of the deacon as we know it today in any official capacity. It should also be noted that within months of moving the seminary to this hill in 1910, he immediately instituted a study course on women in ministry, one of the first of its kind anywhere. He had a great appreciation and respect for the place of ministry by women in the local churches. 
On the, on the subject of women in the pastorate, he was very plain. He left no doubt to his desire for the trajectory of this seminary throughout the coming generations. Again, from the pastoral epistles section, Interpretation of the English Bible, page 34, listen to his own words. The custom of some congregations of having a woman as pastor is in flat contradiction to the apostolic teaching and is in open rebellion against Christ our King and high treason against his sovereignty. Under no circumstances conceivable is it justifiable. Strong words. This pretty much leaves no doubt as to where the seminary stands in relation to the maintaining the vision of our founder. Carroll was not just a giant in stature, but in influence because he was a man of courage and conviction and consistency. Finally, he was a man of cooperation. That is to say, he was a denominational loyalist. Back in 1894, it was Carroll who was the national point person in rallying support behind the Foreign Mission Board when T.P. Crawford and others launched their independent movement. It was Carroll who influenced Texas Baptists to align with the Home Mission Board of the SBC in 1898. Again, in 1906, it was Carroll who led the way in the establishment of the Department of Evangelism in the Home Mission Board. And in a remarkable move, he broke from Norris and moved his membership from First Baptist Church not long before he died as he watched the Fort Worth pastor become more and more polemic in his approach to the SBC. Carroll was a man who believed in cooperation. However, he did not believe in cooperation without any cost. Perhaps his best-known feat, as I close, of denominational loyalty came while serving on the board of Southern Seminary during the Whitsitt Controversy. William Whitsitt became the third president of Southern Seminary upon the death of John Broadus in 1895, and he began to advocate that baptism by immersion was not a commonly held Baptist distinctive that had been passed through the centuries, but had its beginning among English Baptists as late as 1641. This firestorm spread through the SBC that was increasingly influenced by landmarkist ideas like a wildfire and brought about the first big challenge to SBC unity. Carroll's involvement was motivated by his passion that SBC institutions were accountable to the local churches. He carried the matter to what he called the common people of the churches across the SBC and led to Whitsitt's termination and the threat of the SBC's disassociation from its mother seminary dissipated. Carroll immersed himself in the leadership of the denominational controversy for one purpose, in his own words, to promote unity. He being dead still speaks today. Each of us who are official Southwesterners should follow in his footsteps with courage, conviction, consistency, and cooperation. These are our roots here at Southwestern. This is our heritage. And in a day when what it means to be a Baptist is under the microscope, it's not hard when one takes the time to research, to actually read our spiritual forefathers in their own words, to see who the true denominational loyalists and true preservers of Baptist heritage are today. Through the generations, this school on this hill has been the constant and consistent conservative bulwark in evangelical theological education in America. We are called conservative here because we are trying to conserve something, the convictional and doctrinal truths upon which we were founded. And I, for one, am so blessed that back in 1970, my little stream ran into Carroll's great and mighty river of a vision here at Southwestern, and I've been caught up in his flow ever since. And thus B.H. Carroll, though he's been dead 108 years, still speaks today. Dr. Greenway, as you steward our alma mater into the next generations, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for we know our labor is not in vain in the Lord, and do so with courage, with conviction, with consistency, and with cooperation. And in our venerable founder's own words, keep this seminary lashed to the cross. God bless you, and God bless forever the sweet memory and the lasting legacy of B.H. Carroll.